Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Yes to that recommendation. On 27th or 28th August, in a telephone call, he formally advised Her Majesty to prorogue Parliament between those dates. On 28th August, Mr Jacob Rees-Mogg, Leader of the House of Commons and Lord President of the Privy Council, Mr Mark Harper, Chief Whip, and the Baroness Evans of Bowes Park, Leader of the House of Lords, attended a meeting of the Privy Council held by the Queen at Balmoral Castle. An order in Council was made that Parliament be prorogued between those dates and that the Lord Chancellor prepare and issue a commission for proroguing Parliament accordingly. A Cabinet meeting was held by conference call shortly after that in order to bring the rest of the Cabinet, quote, up to speed, end quote, on the decisions that had been taken. That same day, the decision was made public and the Prime Minister sent a letter to all members of Parliament explaining it. As soon as the decision was announced, Mrs Miller began the English proceedings challenging its lawfulness. Parliament returned from the summer recess on the 3rd of September. The House of Commons voted to decide for themselves what business they would transact. The next day, what became the European Union Withdrawal Number 2 Act passed all its stages uh, in the Commons. It passed all its stages in the House of Lords on the 6th September and received royal assent on the 9th September. The object of that act is to prevent the United Kingdom leaving the European Union without a withdrawal agreement on the 31st of October. On the 11th of September, the High Court of England and Wales delivered judgment dismissing Mrs Miller's claim on the ground that the issue was not justiciable in a court of law. That same day, the inner house of the Court of Session in Scotland announced its decision that the issue was justiciable, that it was motivated by the improper purpose of stymieing parliamentary scrutiny of the government, and that it and any prorogation which followed it were unlawful and thus void and of no effect. Mrs Miller's appeal against the English decision and the Advocate General's appeal against the Scottish decision were heard by this court from 17th to 19th September. Because of the importance of the case, we convened a panel of 11 justices, the maximum number of serving justices who are permitted to sit. This judgment is the unanimous judgment of all 11 justices. The first question is whether the lawfulness of the Prime Minister's advice to Her Majesty is justiciable. This court holds that it is. The courts have exercised a supervisory jurisdiction over the lawfulness of acts of the government for centuries. As long ago as 1611, the court held that, quote, the king, who was then the government, hath no prerogative but that which the law of the land allows him, end quote. However, in considering prerogative powers, it is necessary to distinguish between two different questions. The first is whether a prerogative power exists, and if so, its extent. The second is whether the exercise of that power within its limits is open to legal challenge. This second question may depend upon what the power is all about. Some powers are not amenable to judicial review, while others are. However, there is no doubt that the courts have jurisdiction to decide upon the extent and limits of a prerogative power. All the parties to this case accept that. This court has concluded that this case is about the limits of the power to advise Her Majesty to prorogue Parliament. The second question, therefore, is what are the limits to that power? Two fundamental principles of our Constitution are relevant to deciding that question. The first is parliamentary sovereignty, that Parliament can make laws which everyone must obey. This will be undermined if the executive could, 
through the use of the prerogative, prevent Parliament from exercising its powers to make law for as long as it, the executive, pleased. The second fundamental principle is parliamentary accountability. In the words of Lord Bingham, senior law lord, quote, the conduct of government by a prime minister and cabinet, collectively responsible and accountable to parliament, lies at the heart of Westminster democracy, end quote. The power to prorogue is limited by the constitutional principles with which it would otherwise conflict. For present purposes, the relevant limit on the power to prorogue is this, that a decision to prorogue or advise the monarch to prorogue will be unlawful if the prorogation has the effect of frustrating or preventing without reasonable justification the ability of parliament to carry out its constitutional functions as a legislature and as the body responsible for the supervision of the executive. In judging any justification which might be put forward, the court must of course be sensitive to the responsibilities and experience of the prime minister and proceed with appropriate caution. If the prorogation does have that effect without reasonable justification, there is no need for the court to consider whether the prime minister's motive or purpose was unlawful. The third question therefore, is whether this prorogation did have the effect of frustrating or preventing the ability of parliament to carry out its constitutional functions without reasonable justification. This was not a normal prorogation in the run-up to a Queen's speech. It prevented Parliament from carrying out its constitutional role for five out of the possible eight weeks between the end of the summer recess and exit day on the 31st of October. Proroguing Parliament is quite different from Parliament going into recess. While Parliament is prorogued, neither House can meet, debate, or pass legislation. Neither House can debate government policy, nor may members ask written or oral questions of ministers or meet and take evidence in committees. In general, bills which have not yet completed all their stages are lost and will have to start again from scratch after the Queen's speech. During a recess, on the other hand, the House does not sit, but parliamentary business can otherwise continue as usual. This prolonged suspension of parliamentary democracy took place in quite exceptional circumstances. The fundamental change which was due to take place in the Constitution of the United Kingdom on the 31st of October. Parliament, and in particular the House of Commons, as the elected representatives of the people, has a right to a voice in how that change comes about. The effect on the fundamentals of our democracy was extreme. No justification for taking action with such an extreme effect has been put before the court. The only evidence of why it was taken is the memorandum from Nikki da Costa of 15th August. This explains why holding the Queen's speech to open a new session of Parliament on the 14th of October would be desirable. It does not explain why it was necessary to bring parliamentary business to a halt for five weeks before that, when the normal period necessary to prepare for a Queen's speech is four to six days. It does not discuss the difference between prorogation and recess. It does not discuss the impact of prorogation on the special procedures for scrutinizing the delegated legislation necessary to achieve an orderly withdrawal from the European Union with or without a withdrawal agreement on the 31st of October. It does not discuss what parliamentary time would be needed to secure parliamentary approval for any new withdrawal agreement as required by section 13 of the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. The court is bound to conclude therefore that the decision to advise Her Majesty to prorogue parliament was unlawful because it had the effect of frustrating or preventing the ability of Parliament 
to carry out its constitutional functions without reasonable justification. The next and final question, therefore, is what the legal effect of that finding is, and therefore what remedies the court should grant. The court can certainly declare that the advice was unlawful. The inner house went further and declared that any prorogation resulting from it was null and of no effect. The government argues that the inner house could not do that because the prorogation was a, quote, proceeding in Parliament, end quote, which, under the Bill of Rights of 1688, cannot be impugned or questioned in any court. But it is quite clear that the prorogation is not a proceeding in Parliament. It takes place in the House of Lords chamber in the presence of members of both houses, but it is not their decision. It is something which has been imposed upon them from outside. It is not something on which members can speak or vote. It is not the core or essential business of Parliament which the Bill of Rights protects. Quite the reverse. It brings that core or essential business to an end. This court has already concluded that the Prime Minister's advice to Her Majesty was unlawful, void and of no effect. This means that the order in council to which it led was also unlawful, void and of no effect and should be quashed. This means that when the Royal Commissioners walked into the House of Lords, it was as if they had walked in with a blank sheet of paper. The prorogation was also void and of no effect. Parliament has not been prorogued. This is the unanimous judgment of all 11 justices. It is for Parliament, and in particular the Speaker and the Lord Speaker, to decide what to do next. Unless there is some parliamentary rule of which we are unaware, they can take immediate steps to enable each House to meet as soon as possible. It is not clear to us that any step is needed from the Prime Minister, but if it is, the court is pleased that his counsel have told the court that he will take all necessary steps to comply with the terms of any declaration made by this court. It follows that the Advocate General's appeal in the case of Cherry is dismissed and Mrs Miller's appeal is allowed. The same declarations and orders should be made in each case. Copies of our full judgment explaining these conclusions and a transcript of this summary will be available immediately after the court rises and I urge you all to read them with care. The court will now adjourn. Well, quite remarkable, a comprehensive condemnation of the government actions from the Supreme Court, uh, ruling that prorogation was unlawful, void and of no effect. Uh, the President of the Supreme Court, and there is no further appeal on this, President of the Supreme Court uh, ruling uh, that uh, it is now up to the speakers uh, of the Lords and the Commons to decide what they want to do. But given that Parliament now legally has not been prorogued, uh, that means uh, that the uh, state opening of Parliament on the 14th uh, of uh, October has been cancelled. Uh, and it also means uh, that those laws which were lost uh, with prorogation are now back in action. That includes ones uh, relating to uh, domestic abuse. Well, let's uh, first of all get the reaction uh, from uh, our legal expert uh, here, with me. Uh, Catherine Baxi, quite extraordinary. I extraordinary. I think even the, the most uh, hopeful people that wanted the Prime Minister to lose would have been shocked, not shocked, but surprised, pleasantly surprised. The court went much further, I think, than many people thought they would have OK, gone. now let's go to the key points. Uh, why was it justiciable? Why, why should they consider? What did she say? She said they've always had the power, going back centuries, to review decisions made by parliamentarians. They that that is the very function of of what the court does um they they have the power it's it's unquestionable as i said go, going back the supremacy uh, of of parliament is is what they are there to protect and that's what they did 
Lewis Goodall, a uh, political reaction. I, I am uh, quite stunned, to be honest, Adam, and I'm just trying to sort of go through all of the political implications in my head. That could not have been worse for the government. What Lady Hale just did there on behalf of all 11 justices, and I think, and Lady Hale was quite keen to stress this, and I think rightly, that this was the unanimous decision of all 11 justices and therefore has even greater credibility than it would have been a split decision. Quietly and calmly excoriated everything the government and every government minister, including the Prime Minister, has said about prorogation since the prorogation was announced three weeks or four weeks ago. And the political implications are really quite profound. She's essentially said that the Prime Minister of this country act, advised Her Majesty the Queen to act unlawfully. Now, I think in any other situation, that would be, for any Prime Minister, completely crippling. In other times, I think, it would have almost certainly led to a potentially for a Prime Minister to resign. That doesn't seem likely okay. now, well, but truly extraordinary, for, well, I think, from Lady Hale. On that point, the Prime Minister is in New York at the United Nations General Assembly, and our Deputy Political Editor, Sam Coates, uh, is there. Uh, early in the morning, Sam, but how do you think this is going to go down? This will be a bitter blow for Boris Johnson. Uh, Downing Street were very nervous in uh, talking about it. They refused to anticipate uh, the result when we pushed them uh, today. Boris Johnson, uh, uh, thousands of miles away um, from the action, bluntly. Um, he will now face allegations that he misled the Queen since the prorogation that he sent his ministers uh, to enact and that he discussed with the Queen on the phone in August is now null and void. There is extraordinary uncertainty about what happens next. It was okay, in many Sam, ways a devastating... We will be ba back with uh, you with in a moment, but Joanna Cherry, uh, one of the complainants, the uh, Scottish QC uh, and uh, Jolyon Morn there, who've won their case, uh, are now speaking outside the Supreme Court. An extraordinary series of attacks on our democracy. A parliament elected from 46 million of us was unlawfully suspended by a Prime Minister elected from 160,000. Judges have been threatened by a, a number 10 source, and those of us who have sought to protect the only institution in our constitution with a UK-wide democratic mandate have been subject to death threats, and some of us have had our home addresses published. I am delighted today that the Supreme Court has protected the foundational principle of any democracy which is the right of members of parliament to do their jobs for which they were elected. There is much yet to be done to protect our democracy. For myself, I am very grateful to the exceptional legal team and to the almost 8,000 small donors who enabled this case to go ahead. The victory um, is theirs. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. This is an absolutely momentous decision. The Supreme Court has unanimously ruled that Parliament has not been prorogued. Yes! Yes! So there is nothing to stop us, members of Parliament such as myself and my colleagues, from resuming immediately the important job of scrutinising this minority Tory government as we hurtle towards Brexit. As a Scot and a Scots lawyer, I am absolutely delighted that the United Kingdom's Supreme Court has agreed with Scotland's Supreme Court that the prorogation was unlawful and therefore it is null and void. This is a huge victory for the rule of law and for democracy and it's very much in keeping with the Scottish constitutional tradition that neither the government nor indeed the monarch are above the law. As regards Mr Boris Johnson, the highest court in the United Kingdom has unanimously found that his advice to prorogue this parliament, his advice given to Her Majesty the Queen was unlawful, his position is untenable and he should have the guts for once to do the decent thing and resign. Immediately, or as soon as possible. Many of us are here already. The holding of this undemocratic minority Tory government to account must take precedence above all else. That is why we were elected to Parliament to do that. And the Supreme Court today have emphasised 
that the principle that the government and the cabinet are accountable to parliament is fundamental to the British constitution. The courts have decided, not a political decision as they emphasised, the courts have decided that it has long been the law in England and indeed in Scotland that the government is subject to parliamentary scrutiny by members of parliament elected by the people and that for the government to prorogue parliament for a lengthy period of time means that parliament is unable to do that. So that is a decision in law, not a political decision. The politics takes place over there. The Supreme Court have simply made it possible for us to get back in there and hold this government to account. There were, there were two there were two possible outcomes on the table before the Supreme Court. One is that the decision of the Prime Minister to suspend Parliament was lawful, and one that the decision of the Prime Minister to suspend Parliament was unlawful. Both of those decisions have political consequences and both engage a question which is a question of law, which is whether it is, um, whether it is the court's job to protect the sovereignty of Parliament. There is no sensible way in which it can be said that the Supreme Court, in choosing either one or the other, was making a political decision. Okay. Right. Thanks. Thank you. So uh, there we have uh, Joanna Cherry and Jolyon Morn uh, saying that the uh, court ruling shows that no one, including the Queen, is above the law. Uh, and uh, Joanna Cherry, who of course is a leading uh, Scottish National Party MP, saying she believes the Prime Minister's position is untenable. Now, the key decision as to what Parliament does now uh, lies with the Speaker, John Burko of the Commons, and also the Speaker of the Lords, Norman uh, Fowler. And uh, Lewis Goodall, you have. Uh, Comment from the Speaker. Yeah, indeed. John Burko wasted no time whatsoever in putting out a statement. He said this, I welcome the Supreme Court's judgment that the prorogation of Parliament was unlawful. The judges have rejected the government's claim that closing down Parliament for five weeks was merely standard practice to allow for a new Queen's speech. In reaching their conclusion... OK, then... now we're seeing the leader of uh, the uh, Plaid Cymru at oh, Westminster Lord and Lord in Lord Blackford, Lord. Uh, the leader of the Scottish National Party Lord. and the one and only Green MP, uh, Caroline Lucas, uh, giving their reaction. ..with impunity. This is an absolutely stunning judgement by the Supreme Court today. None of us anticipated <laughs> that we would have a result such as this. It is now very clear that we all have a job to do. We must be back in Parliament immediately. I know the Speaker is going to be consulting with all the party leaders. We want to get back to work. And quite frankly, on the back of this, Boris Johnson must resign immediately. The Supreme Court spoke today with utter clarity and unanimously. We have not been prorogued. We must now return as members of Parliament to represent our constituents. The executive does not have the power to override the, vo the voice of parliamentary democracy and Parliament is sovereign. Johnson must resign. Absolutely. And I think important here too is the fact that we must have a written constitution after this. Thankfully, the Supreme Court has ruled unanimously in our favour, but it should never have come to this. It shouldn't require the courts to have to uphold parliamentary sovereignty. That is why, as well as celebrating this victory today, we must set about putting in place a written democracy. We need a written constitution, a citizens' assembly, to set out that written constitution so that we are not at the whim anymore of gentlemen's agreements that no longer work. This is a triumph for parliamentary sovereignty. This is a triumph for all of us, and I pay tribute to all of the amazing people inside the court and outside the court that have delivered this result. Johnson must go, and we must get back to work. Here, here. Yeah, There's something really important also to say, that this is the full court, all 11, and it was unanimous. 
And I don't think any of us in truth ever thought that they would quash the prorogation. This is a very serious matter. It has huge constitutional consequences. It's a fantastic day for democracy. And at last, the people of this country are taking back control. We're all fed up with Brexit. We want it to come to an end. And the only way now to resolve it is to have that people's vote and get it back to the British people. What we, what, we, what, we, what, we, what we wanted to do is to make sure that we don't crash out on the 31st of October. That was the first priority. It is quite clear that this is a Prime Minister that does not have the dignity that's required for office. He's acted out with his powers. He should go. We want to get rid of him. We will get rid of him. We want to make sure in the first instance we don't leave the European Union on an ordeal basis. I want to thank everybody, colleagues on a cross-party basis that have come together, those that have brought the legal action. Brilliant. This is a brilliant day for democracy. Congratulations to everyone. Paul Brat, this is Paul from ITV. Sorry. Sorry. I think it shows people that this government is, is wholly incapable of solving the Brexit crisis. There is a deal on the table. The British people are fed up with Brexit. We're all fed up with Brexit. And there is a solution to the crisis. And that solution is to get this matter back to the British people by way of that people's vote, that confirmatory referendum. It's the only way through it. But I think it also shows that this Prime Minister and this government is unfit to rule our country. I, I personally would like a government of national unity, and we know enough great politicians who could lead and do the job the British people are now crying out for. They want certainty, they want leadership, and I believe they want that people's vote. Oh, that's okay. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So the uh, leaders of uh, Pride Cymru, the Green Party, and uh, also Change, uh, and uh, the SNP saying that it uh, is time Boris Johnson must go. Gina Miller now. Good morning, everyone. Today is not a win for any individual or cause. It's a win for parliamentary sovereignty, the separation of powers, and the independence of our British courts. Crucially, today's ruling confirms that we are a nation governed by the rule of law, laws that everyone, even the Prime Minister, is not above. Do not let the government play down the seriousness of the judgment today. A unanimous judgment. They have spoken unequivocally. And what I say to the Prime Minister is to repeat Lady Hale's words, the order was a blank piece of paper. Parliament was not prorogued. MPs should turn up for work tomorrow and get on with scrutinizing this government. I would like to express my sincere thanks to my legal team, Lord Panic, Tom Hickman, Mish Gondorea. We have had twice in three years to come to the Supreme Court to ensure that the government does not put itself above the law. The ruling today speaks volumes. This Prime Minister must open the doors of Parliament tomorrow. Account. Thank you. Well, Gina Miller there giving her reaction, saying it's not a victory uh, except uh, for the Constitution. Uh, we've also had reaction in the last few minutes from the uh, Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, speaking in Brighton. Let's listen to that. The Supreme Court has just announced its decision. <laughs> and it shows that the Prime Minister has acted wrongly in shutting down Parliament. It demonstrates... It demonstrates a contempt for democracy and an abuse of power by him. And... The Supreme Court, therefore, passes the passes the baton to the Speaker to recall Parliament. 
I will be in touch immediately to demand that Parliament is recalled so that we can <laughs> question that Prime Minister. Demand that he obeys the law that's been passed by Parliament and recognise that our Parliament is elected by our people to hold our government to account. A Labour government would want to be held to account. We wouldn't bypass democracy. <clears throat> and I invite Boris Johnson in the historic words to consider his position. And become, and become the, and become, I got that message, and become the shortest serving prime minister there's ever been. So, obey the law, take no deal off the table, and have an election to elect a government that respects democracy, that respects the rule of law, and brings power back to the people, not usurps it in the way that Boris Johnson has done. Conference, I thank you. And to consider his position, we've also heard the uh, leader of the SNP at Westminster saying uh, Boris Johnson should resign. Now, what reaction uh, from the Prime Minister's party, uh, which is in New York for the United Nations General Assembly? Our Deputy Political Editor Sam Coates is there. Uh, let's go back to him. Sam. Boris Johnson, on a frankly awfully timed trip, it looks like now, uh, over in New York, a few blocks uh, away from me. The first reaction from Downing Street, just one of surprise. They say clearly this is an extraordinary ruling, but they say that they're not going to give any more details until they've properly suggested uh, what the Supreme Court do. They're in a bind. Here we are uh, in New York. They're meant to be addressing business leaders in just a few hours' time, expecting them to talk, expecting the Prime Minister to talk about global Britain. But clearly, at some point, he's going to have to jump on a plane. Will he stay for the whole day? Will they curtail the, uh, the, uh, uh, the visit um, and go home to sort out this mess? All through yesterday, Boris Johnson was being asked questions, including by Sky News, about what he would do if he lost and whether or not he would resign. At that point, he was brushing it off. He was suggesting the prorogation was lawful. That's clearly not the case. He was trying to give political arguments to what the court today has said is a legal matter. Um, but it is just simply the case that Boris Johnson, whether in politics, in the Commons, or in the way that he's handled things, has taken a series of giant leaps. And whether it's because of the way that he has uh, treated the Queen or the gambles that he's taken, every single Commons vote a, a, a loss, he does seem to have taken a, a lot of risks um, and could end up being uh, one of the shortest Prime Ministers, if not the shortest Prime Minister in history. Um, there is radio silence beyond that holding statement, calling it clearly an extraordinary judgment and asking for more time while they digest the ruling. But inside number 10's uh, mobile team over here in New York, they will be scrambling to work out their options. I wouldn't be surprised if he was on a plane within six hours. And uh, it has to be said, Sam, that this is an unforced error, if one can put it that way. I mean, Boris Johnson could have carried on pursuing uh, his Brexit policy without having to prorogue Parliament, couldn't he? Yes, I mean, you can look at it a, a, a number of ways. Um, if you believe that the prorogation decision, as many people did and was argued in court, was um, taken in order to try and stymie the rebels uh, from passing legislation to bind his hands, well, that clearly failed. It, would, it was predicated on the idea that they would only be able to pass that legislation after the conference season, so they took away some of the sitting time then. However, the rebels got their act together much, much faster than Downing Street appeared to anticipate and passed that legislation in early September, and it now sits on the statute books. Um, equally, Boris Johnson could have continued without proroguing Parliament um, if he does indeed want a, no, a, a deal for Brexit. He needs sitting days to get Brexit legislation through before October the 31st. Um, so there was some tension between those two different positions. Um, I think there will be a lot of questions amongst cabinet ministers 
uh, about what to have what happens next a lot of them are clearly nervous about boris johnson's words uh, and his team's words about judges and respecting the law boris johnson on this trip has said that he does respect the law but has given every indication that he wants to strain at the very limits of that well for the first time that's been tested and tested in the supreme court and he and he has lost and comments like the one that he gave a few weeks ago about being like the incredible hulk where he throws off the manacles of laws he doesn't like and gets mad all of that language doesn't fit with the need to obey the law uh, that looks like it hit, and politics and legal constraints increasingly look uh, like they're constraining him and binding him in leaving leading to a frankly unprecedented and very uncertain situation Sam Coates in New York, thank you very much indeed. We'll have more from uh, you and the Prime Minister, doubtless, in the coming hours.